Um, so Toby Rogers, he's been, he was actually, um, comes from us to us from overseas and did his interventional fellowship here and then joined our group afterwards. He's well published in the real in the field of interventional structural heart disease, and he's probably going to share a lot of his insights that he's learned both from the research side and the clinical side with us today. Um, his talk is entitled Innovations in Structural Heart Disease, and I think he's going to let us know what's going on over across town, um, particularly in the world of mitral and, um, sorry, valvular interventions. Um, so you can take it up. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. So I, I wear two hats. I split my time between med staff uh, in the interventional cardiology with a focus on structural heart interventions. And I spend a couple of days a week uh, up at the NIH, which is where I did my PhD. And we have a lab up there that um, our focus is uh, basically inventing new procedures uh, to treat structural heart disease without open heart surgery. And so I'm going to share some of those uh, with you today because they are uh, treatments that are now available within MedStar. And a lot of our, the sort of the target populations that we, uh, we aim for are patients who really are not eligible for other standard therapies. So we really try and find those uh, niches where people fall between the gaps. Um, so these are my disclosures. In terms of objectives, I'd like to just sort of show you a couple of um, the new transcatheter options to address uh, heart valve pathology focus particularly on the aortic and the mitral valves because that's the commonest uh, heart valve disease that we see. I can't do what I do nowadays without imaging and I'll try and give you a sort of a flavor for how we combine and use multi-modality diagnostic imaging including ultrasound, so echocardiography, but also CT and MRI to plan uh, these catheter procedures. And then finally, just let, to review some of the, sort of the latest interventional techniques and therapies for these patients who are really ineligible for conventional therapies, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. I think it's always nice to start with a case and try and ground uh, uh, the, these, these sort of concepts in reality. So this was a patient who we saw um, last year. She's 74 years old typical um, you know, combination of comorbidities, and she presented with exertional dyspnea um, and uh, with a reduced ejection fraction of about 30%. Um, this was her echo, and for those of you who are not used to looking at echoes, this is uh, so an ultrasound of the heart. It's uh, um, two views of the left ventricle. Um, down the bottom, I don't know if you can see my pointer, you probably can't, uh, bottom on the, is the left atrium, so it's at sort of four o'clock on the image on the left and five o'clock on the image on the right. And then uh, the mitral valve between the atrium and the ventricle. And then, but I want you to focus on the third, the other valve here, which is the aortic valve, which is at sort of three o'clock in the image on the left and at about four o'clock in the image on the right. And you see how bright it is, and that's because of thickening of the leaflets, calcification of the leaflets. And you can see, I think we can all just pretty intuitive, that valve just isn't opening well. So this is aortic stenosis. This is the diagnosis for this lady. And because we like to do lots of imaging, not just echo, she underwent this uh, detailed workup. And, and we really are talking about multimodality imaging here, because not in addition to echocardiography, um, she had a cardiac cath. So we checked the coronaries to see whether she has coronary artery disease that could be contributing to her symptoms. And then she had a CT scan, which has really become a sort of central pivot mainstay of uh, imaging for structural heart because it gives us these beautiful anatomic images. And in this case, we scanned her from basically the shoulders all the way down to the knees. And that gives us images of the heart, as you can see on the right, that allow us to really accurately size our devices. Uh, and then of the vessels all the way from the aortic valve, around the arch, down the aorta, down the iliofemoral arteries to, to, to determine whether we have access for some of the transcatheter therapies we're thinking about here. So really, you know, any patient like this, the big question is uh, surgery versus TAVR. And this is, I apologize for the abbreviations, but we're talking the surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And I'm an interventional cardiologist, so I'm going to talk about TAVR. For those of you who've never seen a TAVR valve, this is an example of one. This is um, made by a company called Medtronic. It's a self-expanding valve. That means 
This valve, uh, the actual metallic frame is nitinol, which is a nickel titanium alloy shape memory metal. So you can scrunch it down really small to put it inside a catheter to deliver it to the heart. And then when you unfurl it or uh, uncover it inside the heart, it springs back to its shape it wants to be like this. Um, and then mounted inside the valve frame are the actual leaflets, which in this case are made of porcine pericardium. This is the other um, main valve that's commercially available in the United States. This is uh, made by Edwards. It's a slightly different technology in that this is a cobalt chromium frame, meaning it's a metal that you have to, you know, if you crush it down, it's gonna stay crushed. So basically the way this works is you squeeze it down onto a catheter, but mount it on a balloon, and then you open it up inside the heart by inflating the balloon and pushing it back to its shape here. And this valve has uh, leaflets that are made of bovine pericardium. And you see there's a wrap around the bottom, and that's to, to get a nice seal in the annulus to prevent uh, leaking around the valve. So TAVA is a truly um, uh, groundbreaking technology. I mean, it has completely revolutionized the management of aortic stenosis uh, over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, starting initially with the sickest of the sick patients who are not eligible for surgery and then we've progressively worked our way down the risk spectrum, and I'll show you some data in a minute from the lower studies, to the point that nowadays in the United States, TAVA is uh, approved for all patients. Now, we can always debate about what you should do with a very young patient with, for example, a bicuspid valve who needs a replacement and whether they should have a mechanical surgical valve. But pretty much, I think, for anyone over the age of 75, it's pretty much just a given now that TAVA is the first therapy that you consider rather than surgery. And so the concept is that you thread the valve from the femoral arteries in the groin all the way up to the heart. And then when you get to the heart, this is that second valve I show you, we inflate the valve inside the old one, just pushing the leaflets of the original valve out of the way. And that valve starts functioning immediately. And we do this with the patient under just conscious sedation. Um, uh, we don't, there's no bypass machine here. We're not suspending circulation or anything like that. And so, and there's no big incisions. So these patients have just a small puncture in the groin. Um, they're recovering very quickly. We often don't even send them to an intensive care unit after heart valve replacement procedure. And uh, many of them go home within a day or two now after the procedure. So again, huge sea change from the days of everyone getting open heart surgery. And as I mentioned, TAVA um, has now been approved for low-risk patients, meaning that anyone with aortic stenosis is eligible. There are two seminal publications um, in the New England Journal uh, from last year. And I'm, just, I'm not going to weigh you down with data, but I, th this is just sort of the take-home message. If you look at death, stroke, or rehospitalization in low-risk patients, so these are the bread and butter patients who would normally have surgery, and you look at TAVA over the first 12 months, TAVA beat surgery for death, stroke, or rehospitalization, so a lower incidence of death stroke. And basically, this is the, on the basis of this, I think we've all pretty much moved to a TAVA first strategy, at least in those older patients. We can always have the debate in younger patients about what is the right thing to do. And unsurprisingly, if you look at the whole of the United States over the last five to six years or so, you'll see the number of TAVAs, just, which is the red there, just continues to climb and climb and climb. And this is up until 2018, you'll see. And the number of surgical procedures, which was holding steady for the first few years of TAVA because those low-risk patients were still having sur surgery. Just in the last few years, this number of surgical AOT valve replacement procedures has started to fall. And now we're at a point where I think this year we'll probably be three or four times as many TAVA procedures in the U.S. as there are SAVA. So a huge change in how we manage aortic stenosis. So let's just go back to our patient. Um, and these are the pictures of the aorta and the iliofemoral arteries. And you see these beautiful 3D reconstructions from the CT. And what you're immediately struck by is the amount of calcium. That's the white that you see surrounding the arteries here. Um, so this is typical for the sort of 70, 80 year old patients. They get calcified vessels. But if we then zoom in and actually look at those arteries in cross section, we start to see that there's a lot of disease here, and the measurements that we get of the actual diameter of the vessels are very small. So on the right, we were measuring as small as four millimeters in diameter, and on the left, external iliac, uh, again, four, approximately four millimeters. 
those catheter valves that I showed you, they're pretty small, but they're still, you know, bulky. We require typically 5.5 to 6 millimeters uh, or more in order to be able to thread these, these catheters through the, through the arteries to the heart. So this, problem has, this patient has a problem in that uh, her iliofemoral arteries are too small. Now, all roads lead to Rome, so um, the femoral arteries are not the only way to get to the heart. Two other common ways of doing this would be to go through the subclavian uh, arteries or even the carotid arteries, meaning a surgical cut down to the carotid and thread the, 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 the valve through there. But our preferred option at, at uh, the hospital center is transcaval access, which is a technique that was actually developed at NIH in the lab that I work on up there. And the concept here, everyone thinks it's a bit crazy at first, so please bear with me. But the concept is that actually, if you think about it, the veins in the groin lie very close to the arteries. And even if your arteries are very diseased and very small, the veins are nice and big and stretchy. So the concept of transcaval is that we initially enter the femoral vein in the groin, and then in the abdomen, we puncture across from the IVC into the aorta, initially with a very small wire, and then we progressively go bigger and bigger until we can put a big sheath or tube in, which allows us to deliver the valve. And that's approximately the size of your pinky finger. So yes, we're making a hole in the aorta in the abdomen the size of your pinky finger. But just like the proverbial sort of, you know, the child, the little boy who put his finger in the dam to save the Netherlands, um, so long as that sheath is across, you don't bleed. There's no hole. When you pull it out, we have to close the hole on the way out. And we do this typically using uh, nitinol closure devices, the sort of devices that we use to close holes in the hearts in babies. But you're right, this does sound crazy. We're taught at medical school that if you have an uh, injury to, a, to your aorta, you're going to exsanguinate. And that is true in the setting of an intact retroperitoneum, sorry, of a, of a damaged retroperitoneum space, such as a pelvic injury or pelvic trauma. But if your retroperitoneum is intact, then actually the pressure that surrounds the IVC in the aorta is ever so slightly higher than the pressure inside the IVC. It has to be that way, otherwise we'd all be walking around with giant elephant legs. And so if you make a hole in the aorta, but there is an adjacent hole in the IVC, then any blood that leaves the aorta, meaning bleeding, will actually just go back and follow the pressure gradients and go back into the IVC rather than collecting in the retroperitoneal space. And this is the physiology that we rely on uh, during transcaval. And just to illustrate that in a model, so this is two tubes, one arterial pressure tube and one uh, venous pressure surrounded by a bath that is at slightly higher pressure. And this is what you expect to happen if you just make a hole in the aorta. You're just going to bleed into the retroperitoneal space. But if there is an adjacent hole in the IVC, then something very different happens. The blood goes from the aorta to the IVC and remains intravascular. You're basically just creating an arteriovenous shunt, just like a dialysis fistula. And this is very well tolerated. We all have dialysis patients wandering around, and they cope just fine with that um, left to right shunt. So this is the principle that we rely on during transcaval. We plan these procedures very carefully using CT, do all the measurements we need so we know when we go in there. And for crossing from one to the other, there's a lot of detail here, but essentially what we do is we take a surgical bovie that you can see here on the right of the screen, and we clamp it to the back of a wire, guide wire, and then we energize that guide wire to literally vaporize tissue on the front end. So on the left-hand image just shows you an 014 guide wire, which is a coronary diameter guide wire that we're going to use to burn across from the IVC to the aorta. So I thought I'd show you the pictures of our patient. So here you can see on the left, we have a snare in the aorta, and I'll let that play through once more. And we burn through from the IVC. So we've got a catheter in the IVC, a catheter in the aorta, just a small catheter in the aorta, and we burn through into a snare, which is like a, a bullseye target. And then we grab that wire, and then we advance the wire up to the uh, aortic arch to create a nice rail. And then we progressively upsize to a stiffer wire, and then we advance the sheath. So this is a big sheath, approximately the size of a pinky finger, and it's being advanced through. And again, I'll let that play through, and you'll see the dilator, the tip of the sheath is through, and then we're right up against the wall of the aorta. You see a little pop, and now that sheath is through and in the aorta.
And what that and the next step essentially is we now can deploy our tablet device, just like I showed you before. We can use either that balloon expandable valve because now we're in the aorta, as if we had come from the femoral arteries. At the end of the procedure, we close the hole. And so what you see here on the left screen is a catheter and a little plug. That we're using a plug like in the top left of the screen here, which is a, uh, designed it really to close patent ductus arteriosus in neonates. But if you think about it, this is very similar to a PDA. This is a shunt between the aorta and a low pressure system, in this case, the IVC, not the pulmonary artery. But we're basically using the plug in the same way. So we deployed a, uh, across, the, uh, across the, 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 the fistula between the two vessels. And then uh, we take a picture. And you can see here the plug sitting in the wall of the aorta, um, but no bleeding. Now this is what we'd like to see in every case, but actually based on our experience with Trendscape, when we ran a prospective clinical trial a few years ago, it's actually very common to see uh, fistula, persistent fistula, at least for the first few sort of minutes and hours after the procedure from the aorta to the cava, and this just shows us all the pattern. So approximately a third of patients in the prospective study um, sponsored by NHLBI had a complete closure like the one I just showed you. Um, Approximately just 2% of patients have a little bit of extravasation and we have to do a little bit more work. But the majority of the patients, 60%, had a residual fistula. And so uh, what I'd like to show you is, um, is a device that we then designed and tested here at the hospital center and at a couple of other centers in the US uh, last year. And this was a dedicated closure device. So it's a device that is designed specifically to close transcaval uh, tracts. This is what it looks like on the left. It has a couple of specific features that uh, improve over the, the plug that I showed you before. It has more fabric built into it to achieve rapid hemostasis. It has a central guide wire that means that we never lose access uh, during deployment. And it is fully retrievable and repositionable, which is always attractive for these devices. You don't just have one shot at it. You can reposition, you can fine tune it until you get it right. This image on the right um, shows you a CT scan at 30 days, and you, we've just colored in the plug in green there. You can see how it sits between the two vessels. This was a, an early feasibility study, so a small number of patients. These are the 12 patients who were enrolled in the study. And uh, you see uh, here we achieved 75% immediate hemostasis on the table compared to just that 34% with the earlier device, so a marked improvement. And uh, at 30 days, all of these patients had a complete closure of the tract, and you can see the devices in all those 30 patients here. So I think going forwards, this procedure will get easier with more dedicated devices, because up until now, we've been doing it with off-the-shelf, uh, off-label devices like that Amplatzer closure device that clearly was designed to close a PDA, and we're using it down in the abdomen to close an iatrogenic fistula between the aorta and the cava. This next problem is not specific to that patient that we meant to discuss before, but we're seeing increasing numbers of patients now who have had an aortic valve replacement, surgical aortic valve replacement, um, and when they were in their 50s or 60s, the surgeon probably said, well, you know, you should have a mechanical valve. And they said, well, I don't want to take warfarin, so I want a biprosthetic valve and I'll deal with the consequences down the line. And here they are 10, 12, 15 years down the line, and their valve has narrowed down again, they're symptomatic again, and they need something doing. Redo surgery is always unattractive. It's always more difficult. There's more scarring. Uh, the tissue plane is more difficult. And so it seems obvious and very attractive that if we can just put a new valve inside the old one, then potentially we can uh, give them and buy them another 10, 15 years or so uh, without having to have another big open heart surgery. The problem is, is that because of the way surgeons implant uh, surgical valves, typically above the annulus, and they put in the biggest valve they can to get best hemodynamics. This phenomenon is something that we're coming across more and more commonly, which is that the coronaries are at risk of occlusion because we don't remove the old valve when we put a taver in. Just like I showed you before, we just push the disease valve out of the way. We can actually occlude the coronary arteries, like the image on the middle here, um, by pushing the leaflets of the surgical valve out of the way. And so if we see this on a CT scan and we can model this and predict it in advance pretty accurately, then we only have two options. Either we say, well, sorry, we can't help you because TAVA's not safe. Uh, you're just going to have to live with your symptoms. 
or the patient has to have surgery again. And so we uh, approach this using, the, uh, using these sort of similar electrosurgical techniques that I showed you before for transcaval to cut the leaflet of the surgical valve uh, before we implant a catheter valve. So just compare the images here. This is the same surgical valve. It's a mitra flow uh, surgical valve. And inside it, we've implanted a TAVA valve. And just look at the two images on the left, A and C. You can see here how the leaflets of the surgical valve just get plastered in the open position. And you can imagine if there was a coronary artery coming off right in front of you, that could be occluded by that leaflet. And so we developed this technique called basilica, where we split the leaflet of the surgical valve using catheters. And I'll show you how we do that in a moment. So that when we then implant the transcatheter valve inside, blood can flow through that split and preserve flow to the coronary arteries. This movie shows how we do it. It's done uh, with catheters from the femoral arteries, um, one catheter above the valve and one below. We position a snare, which is basically a wire loop to capture a wire under the valve. And then we electrify, just like we did with transcable, to perforate through the base of the leaflet and create a wire loop. And then we re-electrify that guide wire to lacerate the leaflet from base to tip. And actually, these leaflets, even when they're split down the middle, function very well, and we typically don't see any kind of hemodynamic compromise from aortic regurgitation. But when we put the transcatheter valve inside and plaster those leaflets aside, then actually the two halves splay like the curtains in a movie theater, uh, allowing flow through the split segment and down to the coronary arteries. You can see at sort of uh, 10 o'clock on this image. This is a, just a, a picture from, I think this was literally our third case uh, in the world, and this was a couple of years ago. So here what you can see in the movie, if it will play hopefully, or what you don't see very well, sorry, is the, the, the black line that you see running diagonally across the screen, that's the surgical valve. All the wires you see on the left of the screen are the, the um, steel wires that the surgeon used to sew the um, sternum back together again. And here you can see the catheters that we talked about before. So we have one catheter through the valve with a wire loop sitting below, a second catheter above, and you can see that guide wire being electrified to burn through the leaflet. The next step, we're going to actually lacerate it, and here you can see the catheters being pulled up onto the leaflet. We energize, we burn, we slice the leaflet. And then where we implant the valve inside, you can see that this valve is right up above, and this is the left main coronary artery coming off at three o'clock here. And yet when we inject X-ray dye down, we get good flow down the coronary and preserve uh, coronary perfusion. So again, a, a light, potentially life-saving um, treatment allowing patients who would otherwise have been turned down for TAVA to, to undergo a, a transcatheter procedure and avoid the need for open surgery again. If you're interested, then we've uh, published many papers on this, including this one, which was the, the report from the prospective study. Let's move on a little bit and talk about a different disease, uh, mitral regurgitation. And this, uh, I'm sure you all have patients with mitral regurgitation, and we often struggle with what to do with these patients. The truth is, if you have mitral regurgitation because there's a problem with one of the leaflets of your mitral valve, we do have good options. Surgery is a great treatment for degenerative or primary mitral regurgitation caused by disease of the leaflets. And if you're too high risk for surgery because of other uh, comorbidities, then actually we have some great treatments for that, including things like the mitral clip, where we clip the two leaflets together. Functional mitral regurgitation, of which there is probably a lot more out there, is caused by stretching of the ventricle, typically in the setting of heart dilated cardiomyopathy, be it ischemic or non-ischemic, the leaflets themselves are still okay, but they're being pulled apart by the papillary muscles and by the annulus that stretches. And so you just have a hole through the middle because they no longer come together and co-opt. And, so, and, and, and you, that creates the regurgitant orifice and allowing flow back into the, the left atrium, causing higher pressure in the left atrium, pressure on the lungs, and pulmonary edema. I mentioned just a minute ago edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair on the mitral clip. This is what it looks like, the actual clip. It's basically a staple that we use to staple the leaflets together in the middle, like you can see on the image on the right. And uh, this treatment's been around for a number of years. 
has been shown to be very effective for degenerative mitral valve uh, disease. But then just uh, recently, uh, the COAP study was published, which really sort of ch was, again, another game changer. And I want to just spend a moment talking about this. So this was the use of the mitra clip edge to edge, so clipping the leaflets together in patients with heart failure and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. And when this data was presented at a big conference a couple of years ago, um, there were audible gasps in the room. People were, couldn't believe what they were seeing. Because if you look at heart failure hospitalizations, mitra clip plus, uh, plus medical therapy versus medical therapy had a huge beneficial effect with a number needed to treat of three. You only need to put three of these in to prevent hospitalizations. But even more impro impressively, the CLIP had a, a really dramatic impact on mortality. So mitra CLIP plus medical therapy versus medical therapy over a two-year period, number needed to treat to say one life, six. So if you take six patients with heart failure and mitral regurgitation and you CLIP them, you will save a life over a two-year period, which there are very few therapies, certainly in, uh, in interventional cardiology, but I would argue in most, much of cardiology that are this effective. And uh, FDA approved this therapy last year, and we're just at the final stages of, uh, of CMS approval for reimbursement. So I think that this therapy will be an option for uh, patients with functional mitral regurgitation uh, in the very near future. But I want to just spend a moment talking to you about a different approach, which is rather than clipping the leaflets together, why not try and treat the underlying problem that causes the, the functional regurgitation, which is stretching of the annulus. And for those of you who are interested or know about mitral valve surgery, most mitral valve surgeries for functional uh, mitral regurgitation involve implantation of an annuloplasty ring. So the surgeons will put a rigid ring around the annulus to cinch it back down uh, to the size it needs to be. So I'm going to show you a, a, a treatment that we are currently um, pioneering here at the hospital center. This is a device that was, and a technique that was invented again at our lab up at NIH called um, mitral cyclage annuloplasty and it's developed in, com in uh, collaboration with a small, small business that's NIH funded out of Boston. It's performed via an internal jugular approach and we pass a catheter down through the tri um, tricuspid valve and open a snare in the right ventricular outflow tract. And then a second catheter is advanced into the coronary sinus. And if you remember your anatomy, the coronary sinus beautifully lies along the posterior mitral annulus. So it's in an anatomical location that's very favorable to perform a percutaneous annuloplasty. We then navigate a wire through the myocardial septum, catch it in the RVOT and externalize that wire. And we've now created, if you think about it, a loop all the way around the mitral valve. We then switch that wire out for a permanent implant, which is basically a glorified suture or a shoelace, to put it really in lay terms. And mounted on that is a rigid bridge, because in about two thirds of patients, the, cor the circumflex coronary artery lies underneath the coronary sinus, and we need to protect it so that when we cinch this thing down, we don't compress the underlying coronary. Then we bring a permanent uh, locking system down, which looks a little bit like a wishbone um, with one limb through the tricuspid valve and a second limb into the coronary sinus. And then we start to tension it down and we can literally dial up the amount of tension, relax it, dial it up as much as we want in order to affect the annuloplasty, cinch the annulus down, bring those leaflets together uh, and improve the mitral regurgitation. We then lock uh, the, the lock the lock definitively, cut the suture off, and if you think about it, one other advantage to this device is that it sits entirely within the right heart. So we haven't crossed over into the left heart. There's no material, prosthetic material in the left side of the heart. There really is no risk of thromboembolism or stroke. So this, uh, the very first uh, in human uh, of this uh, technique was performed in Korea by one of my predecessors from NIH who went back and uh, worked on this for a few years. Uh, this was done in 2015. Uh, this was one of his very first patients with a big dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, you can see the x-ray at baseline and at six months, a really remarkable shrinkage, positive remodeling of the, uh, of the uh, whole uh, left ventricle, uh, left atrium. And again, just to confirm that it's not just about a weird you know, choice of projection on a, on a chest x-ray, at the bottom you can see the images from the CT scan showing 
shrinking of the left ventricle, shrinking of the left atrium when you reduce the mitral regurgitation. So this, we think, is a very promising technique for heart failure patients because it seems to um, result in this uh, positive remodeling that we don't necessarily see. In fact, we probably don't get with the uh, mitral clip. So in the long run, it may well be that an annuloplasty approach is a much more effective long-term durable result than an edge-to-edge -edge repair. One other very interesting observation from the very early cases with this was that there were a num small number of patients who were in persistent AFib who spontaneously cardioverted without any additional therapy once their ventricles and atria started to shrink down again. So it may well be that this has a, a, an additional electrical remodeling benefit. This is the device that we are testing in the US. Uh, we started the study last summer. Um, as with many clinical trials, we had to go on pause for a few months because of COVID, but we've actually implanted, I think, two patients since then, including one here just last month. So the patients we are uh, enrolling right now are patients with moderate and severe functional MR. We've actually expanded the indication to include moderate MR. Patients who are symptomatic, so NYHA class 2, 3, or 4, with an ejection fraction of 20% uh, or more. And we're actually interested also in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. Commonly, it's those patients who've been in AFib for many, many years. Their atria are huge, dilated, and they're very symptomatic. And we think that annuloplasty may well be a benefit to them as well because it will allow the atria to shrink and reduce pressure on the lungs. This is a patient from last October, just to show you what this device looks like in place. Uh, here's performing a coronary angiogram, um, and you can see the device sitting uh, uh, with the bridge over the coronary sinus, sorry, over the circumflex uh, surrounding the, uh, the mitral valve, which is the orifice in the middle here. Uh, this is this patient's echo. Um, sorry, it won't play, but you can see from the, uh, the snapshot here, a lot of MR at baseline and uh, significant reduction uh, at follow-up. And we, we expect that actually the MR improvements will continue to improve as the chambers shrink down and we've seen very positive results in, the, in these early patients. I think we're, we're on about patient number 12 or 13 now in the world with this technique. Um, but we're seeing very positive results in terms of the ventricles remodeling, the atrial remodeling, the right heart remodeling, all very positive for long-term durable results. I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit about MRI. I've talked about uh, echocardiography. I've talked about um, CT. But MRI is a modality that we all think of as a diagnostic imaging modality. And I'd like to show you, just spend a few minutes talking about how actually it does potentially have a role as an interventional imaging modality. And this, is, uh, this next slide shows you the interventional cardiac magnetic resonance cath lab up at NIH. So this is up the road. And what you can see in this picture is a standard cath lab in the foreground uh, with x-ray fluoroscopy. And in the background, a 1.5 Tesla MRI scanner, and we move patients backwards and forwards between the two imaging modalities uh, whilst maintaining the sterile field to perform uh, in imaging and interventional procedures inside uh, the magnet. There is one of these setups across the road at Children's Hospital here, and as you can imagine, the idea of doing cardiac catheterization using mag uh, MRI is very attractive in pediatric world because it allows radiation-free catheterization, which is maybe less important in the 70, 80, 90-year-olds that I treat, but certainly in kids, for example, with complex congenital heart disease who are going to need serial cardiac catheterizations over their lifetime, the idea of having it without radiation is very attractive. Also, remember, in complex congenital disease, surgeons do all sorts of crazy things and reconnecting and one vessel to another and shunting and baffles and all sorts of things. And the anatomy can be very challenging. So using an imaging modality that actually allows you to see the anatomy rather than x-ray that allows you to see nothing but your catheters without having to use contrast is very attractive in pediatrics. This is what it looks like inside the room. And for those of you who are familiar with a cath lab, it actually is not that different. You stand at the groin where we're most comfortable. You have the imaging in front of you. One key difference, because a magnet can be noisy, and those of you who have had an MRI scan know that, we wear these headsets which are uh, noise-canceling and allow us to communicate with a microphone uh, with other people in the room or with the people who are outside controlling the scanner. These are the sort of typical images we obtain. And, um, and one of the things that people don't always 
aren't always aware of with MRI is that it is possible to obtain real-time images with MRI, meaning you don't just acquire an image, wait a few seconds, and then get a picture. You actually obtain images and have them displayed in real time. And we can get frame rates with MRI with modern technology and modern uh, scanners of up to sort of 10 frames per second, which is very close to what we have with fluoroscopy. So uh, for it, once you're comfortable in the cath lab uh, and using fluoroscopic imaging, it's really not that difficult to get your head around MRI. And we can actually see what we're doing. Catheterizing a patient under MRI has benefits other than just imaging. As you know, in most cath labs, when we're doing hemodynamic studies, we're combining measures like pressure with other measurements of cardiac output, such as uh, using thermodilution or the FIC principle to measure cardiac output, but then do calculations such as pulmonary vascular resistance in patients with pulmonary hypertension. But the truth is that um, both FIC and thermodilution are notoriously unreliable. Uh, we usually do both in the cath lab, and it's amazing how often they don't agree. Uh, but actually, MRI is very good at measuring flow. This is phase contrast MRI. And uh, so what we can do in an MRI cath lab is we can measure pressures through our catheter, and then we can measure a cardiac output very accurately using phase uh, contrast MRI, and then we can use those to combine to calculate pulmonary vascular resistance, for example, uh, much more reliably, and I would argue, uh, much more reproducibly than, than what we typically do in a cath lab today. And we showed this in a series of uh, patients that comparing FIC done properly, meaning uh, on, uh, on room air with serial measurements and sampling in the correct chambers, versus MRI flow has a very high level of agreement. Let me just show you an interesting patient that uh, we, we cat. This is up at, an, uh, up at the NIH lab. This is a 65-year-old lady who'd had prior mediastinal surgery and was known to have a phrenic nerve injury uh, with a paralyzed hemidiaphragm. This is real-time imaging in a coronal slice, and you can see beautifully how her left diaphragm doesn't do anything. It doesn't move up and down. All of her respiratory effort is driven by the right uh, side of her chest. But, and she'd always been a bit short of breath, but she recently got much more short of breath, was now NYHA class three, and she had an echo that suggested some pulmonary hypertension that she didn't have before. So her physician referred her for an MRI right heart cath because they thought we'd be able to get more useful information than just your typical right heart cath uh, in an X-ray lab. So we uh, used the MRI to guide our catheter through the different chambers, and here are the numbers we obtained and you see her pulmonary pressure is a little bit elevated, the mean of 30 millimeters of mercury, 25 being the upper limit of normal. And her wedge pressure is a little bit up as well, suggesting that she may have an element of left-sided heart disease, which at her age, you know, we'd be suspicious of um, something like diastolic dysfunction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction related to long-standing hypertension, for example. But because she's in an MRI scanner, we can look at the heart. So, here, acquired over about two minutes without breath hold, so the patient has had a bit of sedation, she's dozing off, we don't need to interact with the patient at all. We acquire these uh, short axis images that many of you who have spent time in cardiac MRI will recognize. Um, and we can check and note her left ventricular function, at least systolic function is normal, the right heart is, is, uh, is function is, is normal as well. So we've, we've acquired pressures, we've verified that her left diaphragm is completely paralyzed, and we've uh, established anatomy and function of the, uh, of the ventricles. That's pretty powerful. Well, we can also do this. We gave one mil, one cc of gadolinium and did perfusion imaging of the lungs with a single breath hold. She just has to hold the breath for about 10 seconds. And these are different slices going through the, 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 the lungs, but I'll pause it where it matters. And what you'll see here on the left of the screen, so that's not the side of the circle, there's no contrast, and that's because of that paralyzed hemidiaphragm. But if you look at the right lung, there is no perfusion at all in her right lower lobe, uh, and that would suggest that she's had a pulmonary embolus. So we've basically done a perfusion scan in, during our right heart cath, which, uh, and just because the referring didn't believe us that this was even possible, they sent the patient for a nuclear study, which confirmed that she did indeed have a perfusion defect in the uh, right lower lobe consistent with a uh, pulmonary embolus. So I would argue an extremely powerful uh, diagnostic modality that gives us anatomy 
physiology and function all in one sitting. And uh, I'll tell you in a moment why I'm going on about this, but this is a capability that we'll have very soon here at the hospital center. I'm an interventional cardiologist, not a diagnostic catheter doc, so just doing diagnostic scans is, uh, is not why I wake up in the morning. Um, I like doing interventions. This is probably the, one of the simplest interventions we do. It's an endomyocardial biopsy. We do these day in, day out for the heart transplant patients, for patients with cardiomyopathy. And this is how we do it. We use um, x-ray fluoroscopy to uh, introduce a basically sharp implement into the right ventricle, and then we randomly take bites out of things because the truth is we cannot see the right ventricle on x-ray. All we can see is our device. And if you think about it, this is kind of crazy, but yet this is how we've been doing endomyocardial biopsy for years. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a modality that allows us to see our bioptome device, but also see the myocardium? And this is of particular interest in patients with disease that doesn't affect the heart uniformly, such as sarcoid. We often get asked to do biopsies in patients with sarcoid, and we do the biopsy, and we send it off, and the results come back normal myocardium. And you've no idea, is that because they don't have sarcoid, or is that because we just missed the patch of sarcoid when we're doing the biopsy? So this is an MRI bioptome. You can see on the left just a comparison. It looks exactly the same as an x-ray device, but it's actually a little bit different in terms of engineering and materials. These are all preclinical images because this device is not yet available um, for human use. So this experiment on the right is a pig, and the device is being introduced into the left ventricle. And just think about the difference between the image I showed you with the x-ray and the image I'm showing you here. Here you can see the device, it's lit up with green on the screen like a lightsaber, and I can navigate it around the myocardium to the target area I want and take a bite. By the way, I can also make sure I'm not biopsying a mitral valve or a tricuspid valve or a cord or some other important structure that I really don't want to see that is also invisible on x-ray. So just to prove that this was superior to x-ray, we created an animal model of focal disease. So we created a localized infarct uh, in the left ventricle, and we labeled it with fluorescent microspheres, meaning if we were on target and we managed to get a biopsy of that tissue, it will glow in the dark under um, UV light, whereas if we hit normal myocardium, it won't glow at all. Uh, we used a special inversion recovery real-time MRI sequence, which basically means like late gadolinium, but with real-time, that allow us to uh, identify the area of abnormality in the myocardium, just like we would if this patient, for example, had sarcoid. We can then target the MRI bioptome to this. And we did this with the MRI, and then we went over to X-ray, and we tried to do the same thing using the X-ray biopsy forceps. So these are the specimens that we um, obtained with the X-ray on the left, and the MRI on the right, and then we turn on the UV light. And if we hit on target, the specimen should glow in the dark. So this is what it looked like, those same picture at the top, just under UV light, and we got one on target. All the others were normal myocardium. We completely missed, versus the MRI, whereas we missed all but one. So by having an imaging modality that allows you to see the disease and see the heart and see the structures and see your device, we think we have a much better yield. So this uh, device and this uh, uh, strategy is very exciting to me uh, because I think it will allow us to do a much better job with, with endomyocardial biopsy and diagnostics in the future. A few minutes about MRI more generally. If you take a normal MRI scanner and you put a metallic device into it, be that a biopsy forceps, a guide wire, a catheter, it's going to heat up. And in fact, it can heat up very quickly to almost 100 degrees Celsius, meaning you can cook tissue on the tip of your wire. And that obviously makes us very sad. So what that essentially means is that most of the devices that we have in the cath lab today cannot be used in an MRI scanner, which is a complete handicap. There are some catheters we can use. For example, for a right heart cath, we can use a non-metallic catheter. These are just made of plastic, and so they're intrinsically safe in, in a magnet. And we can do things like right heart cath with this, but to do anything more ambitious, such as ballooning or stenting or a biopsy, we obviously need something else. This is an example of a right heart cath like I showed you before. And what we do is we take a catheter that's made of plastic, we fill the tip of it with the balloon on the end of it with gadolinium, and then we just navigate through the different chambers of the heart. It's almost like playing Pac-Man or something. 
you literally just have to navigate the catheter through from the right atrium to the right ventricle to the branch pulmonary arteries by navigating that white ball from one chamber to the other. And this, of course, the fact that we can see the structures of the heart and see the different chambers makes this very easy. And it's also very easy if the anatomy is abnormal in the setting of, for example, either congenital heart disease or corrected congenital heart disease with some weird surgical repair. And so our strategy in the past was, well, let's take a catheter or a guide wire or a biopsy forceps and make a new one that is okay for MRI. But you can imagine, we have hundreds of catheters in the cath lab. We have to go back and redesign every single one of them. That's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly expensive and not realistic. So more recently, our approach has been, why don't we change the MRI scanner rather than all the devices? And actually, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but if you take standard MRI Cartesian-based uh, fluoroscopy and you switch to a spiral-based MR fluoroscopy, we can reduce the amount of energy that's delivered during the scanning process and reduce the amount of heating by 70-fold just by changing the scanning parameter. And that means that we could take certain guide wires, like this one here, Nitrix, which is a nitinol or a metal, metallic guide wire, and we can use it safely without heating. But even more exciting to me is, is, is actually to truly change the MRI scanner, meaning change the field strength. So most cardiac MRI scanners are either 1.5 or 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla we don't like for, uh, for interventional uh, cardiac procedures because the real-time imaging I showed you is actually very difficult. So most people up until now for these interventional procedures have been using 1.5 Tesla scanners that you can just buy off the shelf from Siemens, Philips, GE, anyone. And if we uh, take, but if we take the field strength and reduce it from 1.5 to 0.55, don't ask me why it's a very specific number, but there is a reason for that. Then actually, the heating uh, go is uh, reduces in proportion to the square of the uh, the field strength. So compared to a three tester scanner, just by reducing the field strength, we have 30 times less heating. And what this means is that with a low field scanner, we could potentially just take the catheters and guide wires that we have in the cath lab now and use them without any modification at all, which means we'd be able to do a lot more. And so we did it. Uh, well, this is the images from a colleague of mine, Adrian Campbell Washburn, who's a very uh, smart P uh, MRI physicist at NIH. And uh, working with Siemens, she took a 1.5 Tesla scanner and reduced the field strength down to 0.55 Tesla but maintaining all the other advanced uh, hardware and uh, software that goes with a modern scanner. And these images were acquired on that low field scanner. And I challenge anyone who does cardiac MRI to look at these Cine flow, parametric mapping, angiography, late gallium imaging at low field and tell the difference between this and a 1.5 Tesla. And so we can get all of the images that we need from a diagnostic purpose, but we can also put uh, catheters and guide wires in uh, without problems. This is just an example in an animal of a metallic guide wire being introduced uh, up the aorta and round and down into the ventricle uh, without any problems of heating that I mentioned before. One interesting uh, additional benefit of a low field scanner is that suddenly you can see lung much better. And so these are the images on the left of, uh, of the lungs at 1.5 Tesla. Uh, and images on the right at 0.55 Tesla with almost CT quality images of the lungs with an MRI scanner, which is, uh, I think, really potentially very interesting. Another advantage to us as cardiologists is that most of many of our patients, particularly the heart failure patients, have devices. They have permanent pacemakers, defibrillators, or uh, CRT devices, biventricular pacemakers. And Whilst many of the modern devices are MRI conditional, meaning you can, you can put them in an MRI scanner, they often cause a lot of artifacts. At lower field strength, a lot of those artifacts are much more manageable. And so here's a patient with a permanent pacemaker. We get beautiful images of the heart uh, with, uh, with cardiac MRI without all the horrible artifacts from the device. And so uh, this, this scanner is currently a prototype up at NIH. But I have, uh, from good authority, I understand that within a year or two, these low field scanners will be available um, as product from Siemens. Uh, and not only will they be useful, 
for these sorts of applications, but they will probably also be much cheaper than a 1.5 Tesla scanner because there's less copper involved, there's less helium involved. And so hospitals, we think, will be able to buy more of these and have them down in the emergency room, use them much more freely than we do at the moment. So I'm running out of time. I'd like to leave some time for questions, but I hope that I've been able to show you how some, many patients are now eligible for transcatheter procedures rather than surgical therapies for structural heart disease. And that some of the innovations that we are uh, actively involved in here at, uh, at the Washington Hospital Center allow patients who would typically be ineligible for these transcatheter procedures to also involve surgery. And then finally, I hope that I've been able to give you a, a sort of a little taste that MRI is not just a diagnostic imaging modality. Um, and this is important because you may or may not know that uh, the Washington Hospital Center just bought a brand new 1.5 Tesla MRI scanner. And we planned ahead and uh, developed the new imaging suite on the fourth floor to have all the other capabilities to do interventional MRI. So we will be able to, to offer this diagnostic interventional MRI right heart cast with all of the bells and whistles that I showed you very soon here at the hospital center. And I think this would be very exciting for the cardiomyopathic patients, for the patients with uh, dyspnea that you just can't get to the bottom of why they're short of breath because we can do all of these more advanced imaging in single imaging procedure. So uh, these are the objectives we discussed at the minute, but let's just come back to our patients. So she's 74, she's got severe aortic stenosis. Uh, we did a successful transcaval TAVA. This is a, her valve implanted inside. Uh, her aortic valve, you can see, we take a picture at the end to show the coronaries are open. She was discharged home on post-operative day four. Um, this was the final picture at the end of the case, the image on the right, you see that plug sitting there uh, with no leaking from the aorta into the cava. And she had a CT scan when she came back at 30 days, uh, which confirmed the plug was in place. And I think, nice little picture on the left there. So I'll, I'll stop here. Five, 10 minutes to go. I welcome any questions. And once again, thank you so much for uh, giving me the time. And if you have any of the patient, any, of you, any patients that you encounter that you think might fit one of these uh, clinical trials or these novel therapies that I've showed, we're always interested to meet them and to discuss them with you to see whether we can help. Thank you.